If you are focused on the AI market or chasing AI stocks, you must pay attention. Today, I'm urging you to look at another tech opportunity. And while it isn't AI, McKinsey says that this sector could grow by 30% every single year until 2030. I'm talking about battery metals. I first identified battery metals as a huge opportunity in 2009. And since then, lithium ion battery prices have soared 900%. But now, with EV adoption accelerating, I'm urging folks to get in on a handful of battery opportunities. To help, I've released a brand new free report, the 2024 Battery Boom. In it, you'll find all you need to know about the coming battery metal surge. If you're a tech investor or a mega trend investor that's looking to cash in on a billion dollar trend, you can't afford to miss this. Just visit 2024batteryboom.com to get a copy of your free report right now. That's 2024batteryboom.com for your free report. Hi, welcome to Making Money. It's Matt McCall, again here at our annual conference out in Vegas uh, for the Stansbury Alliance. Uh, first time guest coming on, a guy I've been watching for many years uh, in the media, CNBC. I'm sure you've all seen him uh, yelling at you at, what, 1230 Eastern time, uh, telling you what to do in the markets and yelling Sounds at your right. colleagues. Yeah. That's so right. Josh Brown here from Ritholtz Wealth Management. Thanks so much for sitting down with us, Josh. No yelling from me today. No, no. You do seem really calm today. I'm pretty, that, chill. You know, I'm pretty chill. For Vegas, maybe you're up a little too late. Well, we did have a late dinner. We did have a late dinner True. and the pasta and everything. So. You gave us a great speech, um, just really on vesting overall, talking to individual investors. Yeah. Um, the last slide you showed, I loved, and it showed basically, you know, this wall of worry, why you should have sold or, or people did sell all the negative news out there. I love that you showed that. Tell me a little bit more about that. So Michael Batnick, my colleague, he's the director of research at Ritholtz Wealth, created that, I think in 2015 or 2016, uh, basically reasons to sell. And he basically took the S&P 500 chart and laid it out horizontally and then put in every big bad event that we've uh, been dealing with over the last few years. We have since expanded it. Uh, we've gone backwards. We've looked at previous periods. Uh, Michael continues to keep it updated through to this day. Uh, obviously, the things going on in the Middle East are horrible, and that is yet another reason to worry, be nervous, sell. Um, but the big takeaway from that chart is that, number one, there's always going to be a very valid, very good reason to want to cash out your portfolio and be on the sidelines, even if you tell yourself just temporarily. Um, most of the time, that type of behavior does not benefit us. And uh, we, we use that chart, among many others, when we're talking to clients and prospective clients about why they need to bear risk. But how do they take that? that? You know, obviously, they may say, you know what, Josh? We, we believe you. We trust you. And, and, you know, but the next time one of those events happens, yeah. aren't they in the phone with one of the advisors saying, shit, what's going on here? I, I can't handle this. Yeah. So it's really interesting. When the pandemic happened, we saw the opposite and we said to ourselves, wow, maybe we're actually getting through to people. Yeah. In late March, in April, in May, I have never seen so many clients say, I'm actually going to send you guys more money. I uh -huh. want to buy. I've never so foolishly I said, "Wow, all our charts, all our presentations, yeah. all our blog posts, we're getting through to people. <laughs> this is not a reason to sell; it's a reason to buy." It turns out that was a nationwide phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, when you look at Vanguard's data and ev inflows everywhere, everybody knew that was not a time to sell, and in fact, it was an amazing buying opportunity. That's really rare. Most of the time, to your question, yes. Things happen, you hear from only a small percentage of your clients, but you know that their mindset is representative of most of your clients. And they say, this looks pretty bad. I know you're the expert. I know I'm paying you for advice, but should we be doing something? Should we be selling stocks? Should we be uh, adding hedges? Should we be selling covered calls? Do we need more gold? It's always, and, Perfectly legitimate questions because these things are scary, especially when they affect us personally, as some of these things tend to do. Um, but we, I think, have a step where we're, we've been around as a firm for 10 years. Uh, Barry's been doing his blog for like 25 years. Um, we've got a very long track record with our fans and clients. And I think they already know what we're going to say. And also, we've been proven right time and again that panicking is 
pretty much always the wrong move. Yeah, I, I always felt a lot of times uh, when I had my RA was I was a psychologist. I was kind of just talking them off the ledge. They just wanted to talk to somebody, yeah. hear something. But you guys do so much writing, so they pro- like you said, they know what you're doing already. Probably just reading all the blogs and writing and, and posts that you guys put out there. So how do you feel now? You, you mentioned Israel, obviously that that is going on over there right now. The Ukraine war is still going on. Uh, we have uh, this country, both political sides, just going at it like you wouldn't believe, worse every day. We can't get a speaker to house. It's just all this shit that's going on. How do you personally, I may ask that, even your clients, do you ever wake up and say, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the world is falling apart. It is falling apart. And it, it, it's always falling apart because things are in a constant state of flux. It's just that sometimes we think things are more uncertain now than they've ever been. The truth is, Whenever you think there is certainty, that's exactly the moment where uh, that's exactly the moment where you're making the mistake. When you think there's uncertainty, you're you're actually right. And so, a really good example of that is how how certain were people on September 10th, 2001? Like we, you know, like there was nothing much going on. Uh, The next day, the whole world changed forever. Uh, So. Just because you feel that things are more uncertain now doesn't mean that's the case. It's just your feelings about the uncertainty are uh, ratcheted up. The truth is, it's always uncertain. Yeah. Uh, I read a lot of history. I read about some of the political division that we had in this country in the 1800s, some of the stuff that was going on around the turn of the century. We have had knockdown, drag out political brawls in the past. They've resolved themselves. This is... This is obviously a bad, uh, a bad time politically, just in terms of partisan rancor and division. But it's all happened before. Uh, if you're waiting for peace in the Middle East, you yeah. know, to <laughs> to start investing, you'll yeah. be waiting the rest of your life. So yeah. we we read a lot of history, and we have that context. Uh, in 2014, there was a conflagration between uh, Israel and, and the Gaza Strip. Uh, it was a bad reason to sell out a portfolio then. It's probably a bad reason today. Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent with you. Is there any trends or sectors that, that you guys are looking at right now that you feel really bullish on? We don't we don't uh invest that way. Okay. Our job is to build a diversified portfolio that's durable enough to withstand whatever's going to come. Okay. We will make adjustments. Uh usually they'll be more of the asset class variety. Okay. I'll give you an example. In 2020, uh for the risk off portion of our portfolios, bonds, treasury bonds, basically there was a situation where you could earn the same return in uh, short dated bonds that you were getting in long dated bonds. The curve had flattened out, inverted. Uh, and you said to yourself, well, why would we have seven to 10 year treasuries at this size in our portfolios when we could earn the same rate of return uh, in a one to three year treasury? So we made that adjustment. It's not a market timing uh, decision. It's not something that we're doing because we're predicting the future. It's just making a decision on behalf of clients based on the reality that we find ourselves in. So the context of the moment. Um, I mentioned that because this summer we reversed that. We actually think now there is some benefit to to taking on more duration risk. The benefit is, yes, it's great to sit in you know, six month T-bills mm-hmm. and have the highest rate of return uh, on the entire yield curve. But you're going to have to roll those in six months yeah. and you don't know where uh, rates will be then. Mm-hmm. So by taking slightly less yield today and a little bit of duration risk, you can actually lock in yeah. a high enough rate. And so these are the types of decisions that we're making. It's less of like what's going to be the best bet over the next year. It's more of what are the realities of the investment landscape today? What can we and should we take advantage of? I, you mentioned the housing market, and um, I did a presentation two days ago, and I, I said, we're not in a housing bubble. It's more of a housing boom due to inventory issues and everything. Uh, what is your view? I know, I'm not an expert on the housing market, but you have a Me view either. on that? Okay. No. Yeah. No, no one is. Uh, most of the housing experts got this year wrong. Yeah. So don't don't feel bad. You can it, we're all entitled to have an opinion without yeah. saying I'm an expert. Most of the people who follow the housing market, some some got it right. Some were correctly pointing to supply mm-hmm. and the lack of new supply coming on as the reason for why prices should hold up relative to other times in history where interest rates have gone up. Um, 
most people looked at the mortgage rate, looked at what the Fed was telling everyone they were going to do, and incorrectly predicted some sort of calamity uh, for home prices. And as I talked about on stage today, one of the big lessons for me and for everyone else of 2023 is that actually, it turns out, housing demand and demographics way more important than borrowing yeah. rates. Yeah, I agree. I mean, what, mortgage rates almost 8%. But you have what two thirds locked under five percent, you know, and so it's tough for them to sell and get the hell out and go buy something for eight percent the same house. Prices have gone up and borrowing costs have gone. You have, up ca- you have cash borrowers in the market. You have boomers helping out their their adult children. Uh, they look at their portfolio. You got an S and P with a PE of twenty. They say to themselves, "Yes, I could keep this money in stocks, or uh, rather than leave an inheritance when I'm dead in fifteen years, I can give it to my daughter now." She and her husband can buy a home. I can watch my grandkids grow up in that home. Yep. And I can watch my kids' inheritance actually uh, benefit their lives today. That is the decision. that uh, We we have 4,000 client households. And that is a decision that we are seeing uh, that generation make a lot. So and it, it makes, when you think about it makes perfect the cost sense, of borrowing, right? it yeah. makes perfect sense. So do you, do you ever do surveys of your clients to get the feel of where they are? Obviously, it probably... It'd be, it'd be great to say, you know, are, are, do they think they are? are they bearish now? Do they think a recession's coming? What are the concerns that you hear from them? So we don't survey. Okay. I mean, I don't know what we would do with that information, okay. I guess. Um, but anecdotally, we hear from the client-facing advisors. Yep. And they will tell, they will come to the research uh, department within the firm, the investment committee, and they'll say, hey, I had three clients in a row ask me this question. Okay. People look at the blogs that we do and the content that we make and our podcast and like where like how do you come up with all these ideas it's really organic these are the questions that our clients have they've led to some of the best blog posts that ben carlson has done michael batnick myself barry uh blair we're writing about the things that people are asking us about we have to research it anyway yeah to give them a good answer why not make that research publicly available and uh, you know, give give that context to all of our fans. So we've been doing that since the beginning, and uh, I think it's a really great source of content to hear what your clients' concerns are. So, what is a concern now? Or you know, you said you mentioned the COVID bottom, right? You said people are coming to say and give you more money, which would surprise me too. I, I I was around at that time doing the same thing. What are you are you getting that feeling now? Are people kind of sitting back because of what's going on geopolitically? They get any feeling from your facing. Uh, Advisors. So this is really interesting year. The head, the the the, the indices are up. The S and P is 14 percent uh, positive on the year. It's not quite back to the old highs, but uh, way off the lows. Yeah. The Nasdaq's up almost forty percent on the year, and yet people that have a portfolio of individual stocks are seeing a lot of red. Yeah. And most of the returns are happening in. We actually did this uh, two weeks ago. We took the whole Russell 1000, all the large caps. Um, we broke them into deciles. It turns out that since January 1st of 2022 through now, uh, which is about, uh, what is that, 20 months? Yeah. The the only two deciles in, in terms of market cap. Yep. So we, we said like largest, second largest, third largest, just looking at market capitalization. The only two deciles with positive returns since since the start of January 2022 are the two largest uh, deciles. So most stocks are not doing well. If you actually just randomly pull up 20 ticker symbols, you're going to see a lot of stocks that are uh, somewhere below their 200 days, somewhere above their 50 day, kind of in a no man's land, not quite back at the peak in, in, uh, that they were in 2021, not quite on the October 22 low. It's, it's tough. It's a grind. Uh, if you're in these magnificent seven stocks, though, and you're not underweight relative to the market, you have something to show for it this year. Yeah, positive but returns. I, I assume that has to be tough because the clients they see you on TV, they see the going across, they see the Nasdaq's of forty percent. But again, if you're not super heavily invested in those several stocks, you're probably way underperforming the yeah. Nasdaq, yeah. and that's got to be a tough conversation. It's one of the reasons why I'm bullish into year end. Um, I think there's going to be a performance chase. I think a lot of active portfolio managers, mutual fund managers were underweight those names with good reason. Like those names are huge yeah. and it makes sense if you're trying to generate alpha, you have to look different. Yeah. And that sounds good on paper, 
In reality, it's not good to look different if you're chasing a market like this and you're far behind. Yeah. So I think actually the leadership stocks of this year are going to see even more flows into year end. Uh, you're going to see crowding. You're going to see people try to catch up a little bit to the indices um, by owning these stocks. And uh, you know who we're talking about. Yeah. The it's, almost like a little win- it's almost like a little window dressing too, right? Putting in at the a end of the year, you're, hold, you're holding that Apple. It looks good. Hey, we had Apple. A little too late, but you know you have Apple. They're going to want to show that they were in NVIDIA. Yeah. They're going to want to show that they were in the, 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 the things that worked. And this is not just 2023. This is yeah. There's some element of that all the time. And... You know, as an investor, you might look at that and say, well, that that doesn't sound like uh, research yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or insight. Yeah. That's, um, but understand, people have career risk. Yes. And this is one of the biggest motivating, uh, this is one of the biggest incentives that exist on Wall Street is to keep up with these indices. Yeah. It might sound stupid, but it's not stupid if you're in that seat and... You don't want to see a billion dollars in outflows next year based on your performance this year. So that phenomenon is very much alive and well. I think we're going to see it play out in the next couple of months. Yeah, I mean, you figure if you're in your office, you look across the street and that guy in his office, as long as you're not underperforming him, right? As long as you're you're both underperforming an index maybe, but you're keeping up. But if you're the first guy that says, you know what, maybe Chinese stocks are cheap. We're going to over-allocate China. Yeah. If you're right or you're a genius – uh, if you're wrong, you don't have a job. Yeah, there's a, the old uh, the old saying: I don't have to be able to outrun the bear; I just have to be able to outrun you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, listen, Josh. Thanks for taking time. Thanks for sitting down with us. Obviously, please tune in, see him on uh, uh, the halftime report on CNBC. Uh, he's on it all the time. Every time I turn it on, and I always know because I'm not in front of him, but I hear him yelling at the TV, yelling at his voice. But hey, you guys do a great job. You're one of my favorites on there. Thanks, Keep it man. up. And thanks for Good coming to the conference, man. Take care. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.